Welcome to Neon Nightmares. We're your hosts, Jillian Berman and Carly Tacos. This week, Carly's going to tell us about a real estate mogul whose life didn't turn out necessarily how he expected. Across the street from one of his many projects was the Red Rock Theater, which mm-hmm. I have a lot of childhood memories at, and I know you grew up much closer than I yeah. did. What are some of your favorite childhood memories from the Red Rock Theater? So we went there all the time because it really was two minutes from my house. So we spent a lot of time going to movies there. But I think my favorite story, or the one that's literally just etched into my mind, was when I went to see The Lion King. We'll probably end up talking about this more as we continue the series, but I have a history of getting hot and or carsick Mm -hmm. and throwing up. So Yeah, you do. Yeah, and it hasn't ended, even though I'm 31 now. It's something that continues through my entire life, but it was really bad when I was a kid. And my aunt had taken me to see The Lion King starring your first crush, Simba. We went into the Red Rock theaters and I can like remember it so well. You walked in, the popcorn was like on the left side. The bathrooms were kind of behind there-ish. And I get in and I was like, Auntie, I do not feel so good. And they were all so used to it because I could be in a car for three seconds and get sick. And so like, it's okay, like just go use the restroom and then we'll go see the movie. And... We did not see it that day because I was very sick. So poor five-year-old Carly just very, very, very sick at um, the Red Rock bathrooms. That's so good. Yeah. Tell me about yours. (laughs) Yeah. I think my favorite memory is the last movie that I saw there was Titanic. And I just remember like there being the intermission. Mm -hmm. I remember those theaters very well. Mm Mm-hmm. Those theaters had like a really distinct scent. Yeah. Can I tell you something about Titanic? Yeah. I saw Titanic eight times in theaters. That is aggressive. How, wait, we were like so young. Um, yeah, we were eight slash nine when it came out. I remember I did see it for my birthday. So I yeah. can't remember if it was eight or nine because I think it came out in December. I mean, I could obviously look. I think it came out in December and I had seen it a ton and it wasn't that I just saw it with my parents. Mm -hmm. I saw it with like all of my friends. Like I said, we went for a birthday party, but yeah, that was eight intermissions to sit through eight times, half closing my eyes while she got painted, you know, and at that age, like those forced cries were really important too. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where I learned that like, God, I love watching a movie to have like some carthetic release. Yeah. And so we would all just like start sobbing and then the other thing i don't know why we did this but we'd always check to make sure each other's eyes were closed oh, and we'd be like, during, like you're peeking yeah uh. yeah be like you're peeking you're peeking and of course i was i mean who's not curious who's not kate so, winslet right but yeah i definitely saw that movie eight times in theaters i don't know why we spent so much money on seeing that movie but I, I loved it. I feel like boobies. it was for the boobies. It was for the boobies. But I also feel like this was at the day and age where a movie wasn't like yeah. an arm and a leg. It was relatively mm-hmm. cheaper. So yeah. it wasn't insane. But that is an aggressive number of times to sit through like one of the longest movies. Yeah. That, I mean, is what? 24 hours? Yeah. Three times eight, if that's 24, 24 hours of Titanic. Since then, I've never actually gone past the halfway point. Whenever the intermission comes up, I'm like, all right, the ship sinks. I know what's going to happen here. Anything else about the Red Rock Theater? Now that I'm like thinking about it, I feel like the Titanic is what sticks out Mm -hmm. most for me. I know we saw like a lot. Oh, yeah. We saw a lot of movies there. Um, But I remember it being like in the phase of the fact that Mm -hmm. it was going to be closing. And that's why we like were specific to go to that theater to see like one last movie well i i have a vague memory of it becoming like and i could be totally wrong like a less expensive theater later where it kind of got some of the movies that had already been out for a while the other thing that i remember one time vividly like 
I don't know exactly what happened, but they flipped the lights on in the theater and everyone had to leave through the emergency exits. And I don't know if like it wasn't anything major or something maybe that happened in the kitchen or whatever. Mm -hmm. I would remember otherwise. But we had to like leave through the weird exits at the back of the like not where you come in, but the emergency exits and then go to the parking lot and get in our cars. I and have left. never been evacuated from a movie theater before, so that's yeah. an interesting experience. I couldn't have been very old, so. Yeah, but it's like something that sticks out in your mind. Yeah. It's so strange to have yep. happened. Do you want to tell me about what we're talking about this week? Yeah, so we're going to dive in right now and talk about Ronald Rubin. We're going to call him Ron moving forward, but he was a well-known realtor and investor throughout Las Vegas. His house was kind of like a compound and located right by those Red Rock theaters, like mm-hmm. you said. And a lot of his business enterprises were there too. He had strip malls. He had different places that he leased to people. Ron was born in Chicago and he moved to Vegas at 34 with his then wife. And the reason why he moved here is he saw a ton of potential in the real estate market, which is ultimately what ended up making him a multimillionaire. Now, before I move on, this is a pretty well done and widely known story. It's a very big in Vegas. A lot of people know who he is. Today, we're going to be covering it at a pretty high level. We're going to link a ton of resources on the website so that you can dig into it even more. But no, this is not the first time this one has been done, and we're going to share a lot of info. But trying to share it from our perspective as growing up really close to where he was. Ron was a super private man. He was known to really steer clear of media, of interviews, or anything that could put him in the spotlight. His house and all of his businesses were extremely secure. They had the best cameras, best gates. He even was known to have like a pack of dogs outside that he could kind of stick on people if he needed to. And it was ultimately all to protect him his family, and his businesses. It was reported, too, that he was very empathetic, really kind landlord to the businesses that leased property to him. His goal was really to ensure that they could keep their businesses open, even if that money wasn't always getting rent payments. He was known as like a community man who just cared about the people. Professionally, again, very reputable salesperson, though very private. Personally, he was a little bit more outgoing. So he was also a gun enthusiast. He was known to carry one with him all the time. He kept it in his boot. And he even had a federal license to sell assault rifles. The other thing that Ron was into is he was into women. He was actually married five times with his last wife being Margaret Rubin. You're going to hear a lot more about her soon. I'm not going to go into more detail on wives one, two, or four. But I do want to tell you about wife number three, whose name was Peggy. So she was known for being more quiet and sweet than his normal partners. She was the secretary of one of his business associates, and that's how they met. And they were married in 1977. It wasn't long after this, on December 20th, 1978, that Peggy actually died by suicide. Oh. Yeah. So Ron was left really shaken by this, and his friends said that Peggy was his true love, and he would leave her flowers at her grave every week. That's sweet. Now, it wasn't long after Peggy's death that he remarried, and it was another marriage that didn't last long, number four. And shortly after that one ended, he married wife number five, Margaret, in September of 1987. Right away, their marriage was really tumultuous. There were rumors of affairs on both sides, which Margaret still denies. Their business dealings together were also really heated. So, Margaret had an antique store in one of the buildings that Ron owned. And remember how I said he was known as a community man, didn't make his tenants pay rent if they didn't have to? Yeah. Well, if Margaret wasn't able to pay, that was not an option. She had to pay on time every time. And that was something she did not appreciate. So interesting. Mm -hmm. But I kind of get that. Like I'm halfway funding your enterprise. Yeah. I guess it has to make money. Mm Mm-hmm. Something like that. Thing like a way to follow up? I don't know. And maybe, you know, having other businesses that aren't paying him, he's like, at least I should be paying my own businesses or my wife could be paying for hers, yeah. right? Not sure the ins and outs of that. Yeah. But they'd also separated a lot of times throughout their marriage and frequently were considering divorce. And in 1988, Ron actually reported a few items missing from his home, one of which was a 22 caliber handgun. He wrote a letter to the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms stating that he thought his wife might have taken the gun, among other items, as she was planning to move in preparation for their divorce. Uh Also 1988, a time where you write the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms for your needs. I do love that he did the responsible thing, though, and report the fact that he Mm -hmm. had a missing firearm. Margaret said that there was actually another side to Ron that people didn't really see. Mm Mm-hmm. She said he had pretty hefty drinking habit and had frequent affairs. 
Again, rumors she was having affairs too, but she fully denies those. One night, Margaret said that Ron even confessed to the murder of his third wife, Peggy. She told ABC7 and 2020, quote, One night, we were watching some crime story, and he said to me quietly, What would you say if I told you I murdered Peggy? I kind of caught my breath, and I said, I didn't, I didn't know what to say. If I had said, yes, I want the details, I would have had to leave. So she said, no, 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 you're not going to relive your guilt by telling me. I don't want to know. She said another time while they were fighting, he slapped her across the face and she grabbed one of their many guns. He wrestled the gun out of her hands and instead of shooting her, shot an oil painting behind her. Wow, this is sounds like a pretty volatile, mm-hmm. volatile thing. It's weird that she wouldn't, or I don't know, I guess I appreciate she's like, you keep your guilt to yourself. I am not mm-hmm. clearing your conscience of this. Yeah, she's like, I don't want to have that conversation with you or have to do anything about yeah. it for me or for you. Ron wasn't the only one rumored to have a violent streak either. He has told friends and other sources that Margaret was, quote, vicious and violent. One day, it was reported that she had a fight with one of their employees, prompting Ron to actually forbid her from entering any of their businesses before 5 p.m. That is, that would have been an intense fight to need to have that kind of measure. Mm Mm-hmm. He also received word that she was eavesdropping on conversations, so he removed the phone line that was connected to the home and the business. But to continue listening in, Margaret and her sister, Donna Cantrell, hid recording devices throughout the home and the businesses. And interestingly, Margaret would actually call Ron paranoid while she continued to hide these recording devices. Yeah, this is not great. I No. It was also through these devices that Margaret learned of Ron having an affair with a former employee. All the while, Margaret starts getting really close to a man named Yehunda Sharon. Okay, so kettle calling the pot black or whatever. Yeah, whatever that phrase is, it's happening. Yeah. Like I said, Ron had done extremely well in his real estate career. He actually had a net worth of about $13 million in 1993 which would be just under about $25 million today. Dang, he's stacked. And in 1991, Margaret was 40% beneficiary to his trust. Oh. Now, by 1993, she was 60% beneficiary. Dang, that sounds like a motive. It's possible. And what's really interesting, though, is considering in 1991... Ron actually had a secret directive to the trustees of his estate, and he told them if he were to die by extreme violence or murder, they were to take extraordinary means to investigate his death. I don't love, like, I feel like whenever anybody goes to their trusted advisors and is like, if I am about to, then they die. Like, just don't go tell your trusted advisors. But I guess this is when you're in fear of for your actual life. Yes. Or divorce this person who's making you think that. I don't know. We have other options here. But what I'm going to do now is walk you through a timeline of events that start December 19th, 1994. Okay. Now, remember, we have two key players here. We have Margaret and we have Ron. So we're kind of going to have two timelines to follow. Okay. On the morning of Monday, December 19th, 1994, Ron did not show up to work at his real estate office. And this is a man that's known as being a workaholic, so not showing up is not like him. So one of his employees called his home and there was no answer. Oddly enough, on December 19th, Margaret's friend, Yehunda Sharon, placed a call to her local car rental agency for a large white passenger van. He also had a really specific request here to Mm. remove the back seat. Oh. On December 20th, which is Wednesday, the Mm -hmm. following day, Margaret hired a day laborer to clean the carpets in her home, specifically in front of the washer and dryer. The man noted that it looked like the carpets had actually already been partially cleaned, but there was still remains of a dark brown substance. Now, officers came to the house, to Margaret's home and to Ron's home on Wednesday, December 22nd. They found nothing unusual, but they did note that Margaret was was reviewing Ron's will, which he had requested from his office on Monday the 19th, that same day he was reported missing. Wait, he requested his will 
and then goes missing. She requested his she will. She requested his will. Okay. Mm-hmm. And I don't love that. Wait, so she didn't file a missing persons report until after she had been contacted by the police. Correct. And she's already looked and she requested his will. Correct. Margaret. Margaret. What are we doing here? Yeah. So on December 23rd, so now four days after he's gone missing, his car was found locked behind the Crazy Horse 2 a strip club here in Vegas Mm -hmm. and there was dirt tracked inside and fingerprints were found inside that weren't Ron's and weren't Margaret's. It was also on December 23rd that Yehunda returned that rental van after putting 348 miles on it, stating he had planned to drive to California for a shipment of holy oils, but turned around due to rain. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Now on Christmas day, December 25th, Margaret hired a locksmith so that she could gain entry into Ron's real estate office and obtain some of the documents she felt she needed. Mm -hmm. So these were like financial documents, some things um, referencing his previous wives, just anything she thought she might need. But naturally, he did not allow her to have a key. So she had to hire somebody to get in and do that. Now, fast forward to January 12th, 1995. It's about three and a half weeks after Ron goes missing. Margaret decides to have the bedroom in their home converted into an office Hmm. so as the contractor's there removing a section of the carpet that she asked him to the section being a nine foot by 12 foot section directly under the bed he noted that he saw dark reddish brown spots underneath it so shortly after he removes the carpet margaret comes in and says hey i got great news from my lawyers i'm actually going to redo the carpet in the entire room they said it was fine Mm -hmm. So he removes all the carpet and again notes that there are even more stains and a scent that reminded him of when his dogs chewed on rabbits. I can only mean assume that means like blood, something dead. of decay. Yeah, something decaying. Now, hanging above the bed was a framed glamour shot. Now, I can only assume that she got this taken at the mall near her house, which was also super close to Charleston Indicator, which is where I actually had my glamour shots done, too, in 1995. Who did we not get? Who didn't get a glamour shot at the Meadows Mall? I have no idea, but it was worth it. Second floor? Oh, yeah. Just, like, right. When right I could up. even picture where you walk in. Yeah, right yeah. up and right in. Right by the Sears food court. Sears over there? Sears was on the one side right by the food court. Yeah. Um, so you got to smell, you know, hot dog on a stick and pretzels as they put your hair as big as it could possibly go. Beautiful. So anyway, she has this framed glamour shot hanging above their bed. And the man that was doing the construction on her home, that contractor, also noticed that this photo had some reddish brown splatter stains on it. And then when he returned a few weeks later, he sees those stains aren't there anymore. But he also claims that when he returned, he heard a sort of blubbering sound from the bathroom and in the bathtub saw reddish a reddish brown blob bubbling out of the drain. Yikes. Mm-hmm. That sounds disgusting. Yeah. So now it's January 23rd, 1995. And a fisherman at Nelson's Landing in Lake Mojave, which is about 75 miles from Vegas, discovers charred human remains. Police investigators found a skull in about 500 grams of bone matter. 500 grams of bone matter? They really charred this. Yeah, they did. And then found next to the remains was a large antique trunk, which had also been charred. Mm Mm-hmm. Using dental records, they were able to determine that the skull and fragments did belong to Ron Rubin. The cause of death was gunshots to the head, with three 22 caliber bullets being found inside his skull, as well as additional fragments. Ron had been murdered and decapitated, then burned oh, and placed at the lake. Because remember, they found his skull yeah. and fragments. So one thing that there is some conflicting evidence on is his bracelet being found. So some people say that they did find his bracelet near the site as well. Mm -hmm. Now, the Supreme Court did not have that noted in their research and on their case, which is why I didn't bring it up earlier. But there are a lot of cases or a lot of there is a lot of research that shows that it was there. Uh Either way, there may or may not have been a bracelet there, but they did find his remains there. Yeah. 
Now, armed with this new information, police reached out to an antique dealer because remember they found this charred old trunk there. And this dealer said that he had sold Margaret a similar trunk in 1994. Remember, too, she Mm -hmm. sold antiques. Yeah. She's an antique dealer as well. Yep. So naturally, they obtain a warrant, and they went back to the Reuben residence. Inside, they find that bedroom that has been fully converted into an office, Mm -hmm. where they saw minute blood splatters on the wall, and they see that glamour shot. And then they find more blood on a box spring that's been left outside in an alleyway near the home. They actually go to a frame store to find the glass that was originally on the glamour shot. Mm -hmm. Because remember, the contractor said he saw it, then it was gone. So they go back to the store because Margaret had actually requested that it be replaced with new glass and they hadn't gotten rid of it. Okay. They also find the electronic recording devices that she had hidden throughout the home. So... Police have surveillance set up in the home and out of the home, really watching Margaret where Mm -hmm. she's coming and going. They note that she pulls up to the house, sees all the police outside in the squad cars, and she leaves. Natural reaction. Right. So they note that she goes to a convenience store. Then she goes to her sister's house, connects with her for a few minutes, and then she goes to Yohanda Sharon's home. So after a few hours, the two of them leave and they drive to Los Angeles where she boards a flight to St. Louis and then heads to Massachusetts. She's on the run. Mm-hmm. In July 1996, a scuba diver at Lake Mead finds a 22 caliber handgun that's wrapped in several plastic bags and secured with rubber bands, leaving it pretty well preserved. One thing to note, Lake Mead and Lake Mojave are not the same place. They're actually, mm-hmm. they have a short distance away from each other. But they find that gun at Lake Mead and turn it over to police. Also attached to the gun is a suppressor, which ultimately just quiets the sound of a gun when it's fired and then hides the muzzle flash as well. Mm -hmm. Police learn that that gun was registered to Ron Rubin. Did we find Ron's missing gun? Yep. It's the same one that was reported missing in 1998. So on April 17th, 1997, a Clark County grand jury indicted Margaret for the crimes of unauthorized intrusion of privacy by a listening device, murder with the use of a deadly weapon, and accessory and accessory to murder, and then issue a warrant for her arrest. It wasn't until November of 1999, so almost, or it wasn't until November of 1999, so over two years later, that she is arrested in Massachusetts, stating, this isn't about Las Vegas, is it? Oh, so sad. The trial was pretty lengthy, beginning on March 2nd, 2001, and the conviction was entered on September 17th of 2001. And she was sentenced to one year in prison for the invasion of privacy by a recording device and life in prison with the possibility of parole after 10 years for count two, which was murder with the use of a deadly weapon. We're going to link all of the resources on the site so you can read more about the case here because not surprisingly, the media coverage was tremendous with this case. With Margaret and her then lawyer doing tons of high profile interviews, which ended up creating a lot of distraction for the case. But again, not going to dig into that too much right now, but we will have a lot more on our site on the blog. Now, at 76, after serving more than 20 years for the murder of Ron Rudin, Margaret was released on parole on January 10th, 2020. She continues to maintain her innocence and hopes of conviction will be overturned. There's a few different things uh, speculating what she's doing now. One says she wants to go back to college and get a degree. She says she wants to be an author and write some books. But most of all, that she wants to go spend time in Chicago with her family and her grandchildren because she did become a great grandmother while in prison. That's and that's sweet it. that she wants to spend time with her family, at least after all of that time away. Yeah. Um. Well, that was a crazy story. Thank you mm-hmm. for telling us about the Black Widow Margaret Rudin. Yep. Again, guys, uh, please like, subscribe, and review on wherever you're listening to us right now. We'll see you next week, and I'm going to tell you guys about the time that the house tried to game the odds, and someone got murdered because of it. Sweet dreams, Sin City. We'll see you next week. Scuba
derver. A scuba derver. Scuba derver. There's a scuba. <laughs> <laughs> There's.